All right, good morning, First Pentecostal. Uh, coming to you live from Jerusalem, the Red Sea, parts of Africa. Just kidding. Uh, obviously, I'm at home uh, at New River. I thought I would uh, uh, post outside online just to try something a little bit different. So I would ask that if uh, this is too distracting, if a boat comes flying by or a squirrel is behind me trying to eat my bird food, uh, we'll do something different. I'll do it back in the house or uh, at the church, but I thought I'd try this out. So I dressed up for my backyard and for my neighbors who were walking around looking at me like I'm crazy, uh, but I think they understand in our time of quarantine or at least uh, social distancing uh, that this is good to go. So uh, anyway, we posted on Slack yesterday uh, that me and Robin have been praying for y'all. Uh, it's been nice, honestly to be in our homes praying. What we have found is that we have depended on the church to do everything for us, uh, to teach, uh, to have prayer meeting. Uh, of course, preaching is for the compelling of a soul to respond to God at the altar as the members of the body of Christ come together, and that's awesome. Uh, can't really do that at home uh, as much as you can teach, preach, or teach and pray and uh, fellowship and socialize and talk about the Lord in your home. So we're enjoying this in the sense of getting back to our home life. I do believe that the church is a supplement, not a substitution. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if we only rely on Wednesday or Friday prayer or Sunday for our spiritual maturity and growth, then what happens when we can't go? Uh, people are understanding that now. They haven't been there. And when they didn't have that in their home already, on a daily devotion and prayer and uh, spiritual growth on a regular basis at home, in the marriages, in the families, uh, then they have nothing when they can't make it to church. And that's just not how it's supposed to be. The church is a supplement uh, to what we already do at home. So I want to encourage you as a uh, my family and I have learned in this short period of time that home prayer, devotion, and time together in spiritual matters uh, are super important, and we have neglected that, to be quite honest with you, in many ways. But we're going to improve it, and we're doing that now. So I'll be glad to see you guys in class. Uh, I'm ready to have some discussion and some things like that. So I'm limited on time. I'm going to keep this 15 minutes or less. Uh, I want to get right into the Sunday School lesson. So last week, if you'll look on Slack, you have notes from then. Uh, and I'm also going to have notes for this lesson as well on Slack. But just looking at last week, we talked about managing conflict. Uh, instead of resolving conflict, we manage it, right? Uh, conflict's going to come one way or the other. Now, it's up to us to make it positive. It's up to us to make it worthwhile. It's up to us to uh, make it functional and have positive aspects. Uh, or it can go very south, very quick, and then uh, it becomes a gridlock. You know, we had mentioned last week uh, that there's gridlocks that happen. Uh, she wants another child, he doesn't. He wants to adopt, she doesn't. She wants to attend this church, he wants to attend another. He wants to go out and enjoy friends, she would rather stay at home. Just look at the notes and you'll see that there's always some issues there with uh, gridlock and miscommunication and conflict. Uh, issues that come up when we're not managing them. Uh, first of all, a gridlock disagreement shares four characteristics. If you'll look on your slide, one, you have the same argument again and again with no resolution. Number two, neither of you can address the issue with humor, with empathy, with affection. It's always done in criticism or sensitivity or lots of issues. Number three, the issue is becoming increasingly polarizing. It gets worse and worse and blows up in time. And number four, uh, compromise seems impossible because it would mean selling out or giving up. Uh, two types of problems we have mentioned, perpetual, solvable. Perpetual or ongoing, they'll always be there. How we manage those perpetual problems uh, says a lot about where our relationship's going to be. So think about this. Uh, you've had the same argument over and over and over, and you've tried to change that person because you wholeheartedly disagree with them on their maybe uh, the core of their belief, uh, how they view it all together. 
But what we need to understand is that 69% of the problems that we have in couples or in relationships and marriages are exactly that, uh, unsolvable. They're perpetual. They go to the core of who, who a person is, what they believe, uh, their values, their systems. Uh, and so we need to recognize that and uh, address it as well. Now, in today's lesson, uh, I want you to take a look uh, at the dream detective exercise. This is kind of a follow-up from last week. Uh, I want you to have a discussion as a homework assignment with your uh, spouse. I want you to both have a, you can make up an argument or have one that you have or an issue or a topic that's already in the marriage. But on the slide, I used uh, buying a new car. As simple as that may be, uh, I know I just bought a new truck in uh, December. Okay, how much conversation did I have with my wife about that? Uh, did we agree on the size, the gas mileage? Did we agree? So what I want you to do is make a list. I want one of you to be for buying an economic car and one of you being for buying a big truck. And I want you to list out the reasons that's core to a person's belief as to why one would choose a truck that has horrible gas mileage over why one would choose a car that is economy. Think about their past, their background. Think about their upbringing. Try to understand them and their perspective. Make that list and then have a discussion about it. I think you'll find if we appreciate each other's values uh, and opinions and where they come from, uh, then we can come to a compromise and select the right vehicle. Amen. So now let's take a look at solvable problems. They are typically situational in nature and once resolved, allow the couple to move on to not have to address the same issue in the future. They comprise the other 31%. Remember, perpetual problems are 69%. Solvable are the 31% of the problems that couples face. Uh, a biblical compatibility, look at the screen or on your slides, you see Isaiah 1 and 18. Come now, let us settle the matter. <laughs> How hard is it to settle the matter sometimes? It's difficult, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though they be as white as snow, though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Now, when it comes to perpetual and solvable problems, uh, I want to share a few things. Uh, first, let's talk about accepting influence. Uh, Accepting influence with your partner, with your spouse, is seeking to find a way to communicate uh, with the other's needs, desires, and wants. It's thinking to oneself, what part of your request can I honor? It is trying to find a way to say yes. So often we are looking to say no. So often, without giving a thought, when our spouse presents an idea, for instance, buying a new vehicle, <laughs> that truck or that, uh, that gas hog or that cool battery-operated hybrid uh, economic car, we quickly shut it down and dismiss it if we are not trying to accept the influence of our spouse, if we're being disrespectful towards their beliefs and values and opinions because we want it that bad. Are you a no person in your marriage? Or are you a yes person? Maybe you're not very spontaneous and your spouse wants to go do something uh, at the last minute planning. Try to find a reason to say yes, as one example. But there's so many areas in our relationships where we say no, when we could just pause, figure out a way to say yes. It's called accepting influence. Uh, on your screen, you'll see uh, your slides. Accepting influence simply means trying to grant at least part of what your partner is asking for and showing a willingness to move toward compromise. Nobody likes the word compromise, especially in the apostolic faith, right? Uh, but we're not talking about theology or religion or one God or baptism in Jesus' name. Uh, we're talking about intermarriages. There is compromises that will be made if you want to continue to be in your marriage, if you want to continue to have a healthy marriage. Uh, research has shown that people who do not accept influence create bad will and wind up being powerless. Why? Because their partner finds them unworkable. Accepting influence is critical for effective problem solving and conflict management. Your wife, your husband is there 
in the relationship with you, if you're always working against them, then your relation, you're hurting yourself. Look for reasons to accept their influence in this time and this hour. Uh, absolutely important. Now look in the screen, uh, turn it to uh, the biblical compatibility. Look at Deuteronomy 24 and 5. You know, there's actually rules of engagement. I got a sermon I preached one time out of Deuteronomy 20 talking about the rules of engagement for warfare. And this is one of them. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. Why would we not take this young man who's just been married, send him to war and do what needs to be done for the sake of Israel and the cause of God uh, in this particular area? He says he will go, but for one year first, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness. <laughs> Uh-oh, New Living Translation here. To bring happiness to the wife he has married. This sets the foundation for the husband in Scripture to accept his wife's influence going forward for the rest of the marriage. Look at Proverbs 1 and 23 through 26. Come and listen to my counsel. I have shared my heart with you and make you wise. I called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice and rejected correction I offered. So I will laugh when you are in trouble. I will mock you when disaster overtakes you. <laughs> now, that last piece, uh, of course, wisdom may laugh at you and there may be uh, when a disaster overtakes you or trouble, but it's not because something bad is happening to you. It's because you wouldn't listen to the accepting uh, the influence of your partner, of the voice of wisdom, of the voice of truth. Uh, and in our marriages, that voice comes from our spouse oftentimes. What happens when influence is not accepted? What happens when you don't accept your spouse's uh, opinions, beliefs, values, input? What happens when you don't share in decision-making with them? Well, you know, I think you can answer that for yourself. You get frustrated with each other. You get upset. You become hardened. Uh, you tune out, don't want to talk to them anymore. And that only creates more problems. So my last couple of minutes, I just want to share uh, one more thing. Uh, remember I told you John Gottman can predict, uh, predict divorce, uh, Dr. Gottman up to 90% accuracy. I think a little more than 90%. I'll have to check my facts on that. Uh, I know it was 90 plus. Uh, this is what research showed. When research showed that when couples discussed an area of disagreement, right, conflict, there was a significant difference between couples who stayed together and couples who later divorced. What is the difference? Look at your notes. Couples who were in stable, happy relationships had a ratio of positive to negative interactions of five to one. That means there was, uh, in the conflict, in the discussion, in the problem, in the topic that they had in the hour, um, they had positive comments that outweighed the negative ones. They found reasons to say yes. They looked for reasons to help one another in that conflict. Uh, it was expressed five times more than negativity when discussing an area of disagreement. Think about your last disagreement. Were you complimenting each other the whole time? Were you looking for reasons to say yes or to honor each other's beliefs, to allow room for their opinion? Or were you shutting them down? Now take a look at that last piece. For couples who later divorced, when they talked about an area of disagreement, their ratio of positive to negative was roughly even with really the ratio being slightly more negative, so 0 0.8 to 1 point. Now that means a little bit less than one compliment to one negative statement. And when you're in that predicament, then we realize um, there's no room for growth, hardness, uh, and that was key factors as to how Dr. Gottman knew people would divorce. Now, uh, as we close next week, uh, we're going to get into the four horsemen. Finally, I've been talking about the four horsemen for a while. So the four horsemen are the areas and issues that Dr. Gottman knew a couple would divorce with such accuracy. But we're also going to talk about the antidote. Well, if we know what causes divorce, then we also know how to stop it and to prevent it. So again, uh, thank you for your time this morning. Read the notes. This video should have be, should be posted with the notes at the same time. 
Uh, if you need something, please let me know. If you have questions, comments, Slack them, text them. We'll address them for next week's uh, lesson. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>